Welcome to Fringe Pop 321, the show that believes the world is stranger than we think, but thinking should not be strange. We have with us today Dr. Judd Burton. Thanks for being with us, Judd. My pleasure, Mike. Thank you. Yeah, I want to start out just in case there are people in our audience who don't know you, who aren't familiar with your work. Give us a little bit of a self-introduction. Who is Judd Burton and what does he do? Well, I am uh, primarily a historian of uh, Greco-Roman antiquity and the early church. I also have uh, a degree in anthropology and training in archaeology as well. You have so and you did field experience too. That's right. I, I have pretty extensive field experience in, in all, all of those fields. But yeah, I, I have considerable experience in the field, both in, uh, in Israel and uh, all across the, the Southwest in Texas. Uh, I'm, like I said, I'm primarily an ancient historian. That's mm -hmm. what my PhD work was in. I did a religious history of Caesarea Philippi. Mm -hmm. Now, because you have an anthropology degree and anthropology training, you get into... I mean, invariably folklore, uh, those sorts of things. So tell us a little bit about that. Absolutely. Uh, well, my primary interest actually uh, in my study of, of anthropology was cultural in nature. Okay. I was interested in the anthropology of religion. And so folklore comes into the realm of that mythology and mm -hmm. folklore, mm -hmm. uh, if we're to use those somewhat synonymously, uh, they're going to enter into the same the same lens of focus, as, uh, if you will. So uh, I, it, it's an interest that I've actually always had. I, I've had it since I was a child. I wondered how mythology and folklore could be viewed mm -hmm. in many ways through the, the lens of the Bible. And I opted to um, take a bit of a break from history and go, when I started graduate school, mm -hmm. uh, my studies dealt primarily with cultural anthropology, folklore, the anthropology of religion. Mm -hmm. Well, you are an ideal guest then for the topics that we're going to do. I mean, I, I'm, I'm somewhat familiar with your work. I mean, I've heard you lecture on what we're going to talk about uh, today and mm -hmm. probably in a follow-up episode as well, and that is vampires. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, I, I don't really know uh, many people who are into, what is it, vamp, is it vampirology or vampirology? How do you pronounce that? Sure, vampirology. E either one, either six one, one half either dozen one. another, okay. Yeah. So I don't know many people who are really into this. It's not in my wheelhouse. And so I thought this would be a good, uh, good opportunity for a guest, and here you are. So let, let's, let's talk about vampires a little bit. I, I think a good place to begin is, you know, is there some sort of, discernible history of where the, where, so I can't even say this idea, you know, where the set of ideas about w what we think about vampires, is there some sort of discernible history uh, for all that just in general? And then I'd also like to know specifically the kind of things that we think of like transformation into a bat, drinking blood, the sun is my enemy, you know, all, all, mm -hmm. all this kind of stuff. Is, is it always consistent, or do those things sort of just get picked up along the way? So how would you talk about the history of this idea? That's well put. It is, uh, it, to one degree, it is a history of an idea, and it does have a discernible history, one which consequently often takes the three aforementioned disciplines that I mentioned, history, anthropology, and archaeology, mm -hmm. because you're beholden to different kinds of evidences when examining something like vampirism. Uh, I think it's safe to say that culturally speaking, uh, it, it's a, a perennial feature. In other words, you're hard pressed to find a culture around the world, mm -hmm. um, you know, through time and space, wh you know, whatever period we're talking about all over the globe, that doesn't have some sort of, of creature uh, or, or idea or spirit uh, that does the sorts of things that we typically ascribe to a vampire. For instance? Uh, the draining of life force. Okay. Uh, in many cases, physically blood. Right, but it could be other things other than blood. Certainly, it could be all kinds of things, vi vitality, other bodily fluids. Mm -hmm. um, you're going to find variations on the theme. But this, this idea of draining life force, feeding off of life force, whatever form that may come in, mm -hmm. often comes uh, very often comes in the form of blood, the taking of blood or, f or human flesh by mm -hmm. proxy. Uh, you find evidences of this 
in uh, certain practices in the archaeological record that go back into to prehistory. Uh, and of course, when you get into the historical period, uh, all the, all of that physical uh, you know, evidence, which is you know, I wouldn't call it a mountain of evidence, mm -hmm. uh, but it's buttressed by the fact that you have these documents uh, that put a lot of those those older practices into context, and certainly the contemporary mm -hmm. practices. Are they things like incantation texts, you know, um, ritual descriptions? Is that what you're talking uh, about? In some cases, and I'm I'm thinking about you know, you say that this this isn't exactly in your wheelhouse, but. Uh, you know, interestingly enough, there are some Mesopotamian mm -hmm. uh, context for this. For some of the earliest, you know, the uh, the Lamashtu mm -hmm. uh, w was one of these these types of creatures or spirits that was said to to feed on the life force and the blood of of, of humans, and actually scattered all throughout the ancient Near East. You have examples uh, of these sorts of creatures, uh, Lilith in all her variations. Mm -hmm. I, I, yeah, there, there you go. With li in, in her case, it's almost like the life force is like oxygen because, you know, you get this what we would might call like sudden infant death syndrome, and right. and so that's explainable by the night demon who you know takes the breath away from children. Right, and that's that. Yeah, that's an excellent point. She becomes the the queen of, yeah. of demons, and and that that is her charge, so to speak, mm -hmm. uh, is to go around and, and take the very life force from in, uh, infants in particular. So this is a lot older than Vlad the Impaler. Oh my, <laughs> yes. Oh my, yes. Yeah, so, so if you were, okay, you mentioned Mesopotamia. And, and again, those are, those are some broad categories. Life force actually helps, you mm -hmm. know. And, uh, you know, the, we, we got into this on my, on my biblical podcast, Naked Bible podcast, mm -hmm. when we were doing Leviticus. You know, why do we have these weird laws about you know, menstruation and the loss of blood or seminal fluid or, the, you know, and it, it's a very simple idea that these things are what give or sustain life. Mm -hmm. And so if you lose enough of that stuff, you're going to die. Mm -hmm. Or if you lose it, it's associated with maybe a, a deterioration or a dying process. Mm -hmm. you're, you're lesser than what you were. And so Yahweh is not associated with death but life, and so you're ritually impure, and then you gotta wait for a few days to go back on sacred space. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a certain logic to it. So you have these creatures who are siphoning off these things, you know, however, in Mesopotamia. Where, chronologically, where, where do you sort of see, you know, what's the next sort of phase or stage? Because it is long before Vlad the Impaler. So mm -hmm. uh, Greco-Roman world, do we have you know, counterparts to Certainly, this? certainly, um, you know, moving into uh, in general, the, the, the Greco-Roman world, you had uh, a number of these kinds of creatures, um, some of which were long-lasting, long, pretty long-lived in the folkloric traditions. I'm thinking in particular of, of Greece. Okay. The uh, Brokolikos was a, uh, a, 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 a va primarily vampire. It could, could be a werewolf, uh, but that that is a, a, an idea that goes back to, to Greco-Roman antiquity. And of course, the Romans also had uh, a, a sort of species of vampire uh, as well. The, the Strix uh, was a, a, a bird-like mm -hmm. um, sort of vampire, mm -hmm. kind of a siren. Sort okay, of now uh, that's kind of interesting because now it w once you get into Rome, just historically, we know that Rome transitions into Europe. Mm -hmm. Okay, you've got this bird-like thing mentioning, and, and even the Lamash too, you know, the certain iconography that's going to have wings and right, all that. Right, So it, it, is that where we get, is, is this sort of the beginning of the bunny trail to, you know, creepy things that fly at night getting associated with this, or is there some other trajectory? Because ultimately you get this bat idea, you know, that we see in the movies mm -hmm. and whatnot. So is this the beginning of those sorts of things? To a degree, I think uh, if you you consider uh, first of all that witchcraft in one form or, or another seems to be the glue that holds all these kinds of, of creatures like vampires and werewolves and mm -hmm. ghouls and what whatever variations on that theme we want to talk about. Um, shape shifting inevitably comes into. Uh, okay particularly in these Western traditions, comes into um, to one, one degree or another. Um, so the, 
the idea of, of um, taking on animal characteristics, whether that's a bat or a bird or an uh, mm -hmm. owl, or um, uh, these are rooted in these, these older ideas. And um, some of them are totemic, you know, particularly when you look at some of the prehistoric uh, and even, even later um, sort of non-literate pre-industrial mm -hmm. peoples. Uh, these ideas about transformation, uh, taking yeah, on the, the ob uh, unpack that term, you know, for our audience. So it's T O T E M I C. Yeah, totem. a totem. Uh, right. A lot of people will be familiar with totem poles from the Pacific Northwest. Mm -hmm. the, the totem is the actual animal spirit that these people believed in. Uh, they were often mm -hmm. uh, rendered in in all kinds of iconography, rock art, fetishes, and in the aforementioned totem poles, those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. But they represented uh, an animal spirit that was sacred. To a, to a certain group of people. So this isn't necessarily, I mean, with the shape-shifting thing, and again, you said some of this is totemic. This, ne this wasn't necessarily viewed as an evil thing or a sinister thing, or was it? In the context of, of witchcraft, and again, this, this depends on what definition we're using. Uh, if you use the anthropological definition of witchcraft, this is a, a witch is basically somebody, uh, male or female, who is operating completely anathema to what is considered the norm in a culture. They often operate on the fringes mm -hmm. uh, of a society. And as I said, all those, those practices are often, you know, they often overlap or dovetail uh, with, with activities that you find amongst vampires and werewolves and shapeshifters and things like that. Mm. So that's why, I s that's why I say that in many ways witchcraft is this glue uh, that that holds all these elements together, and in the case of, of, of various kinds of vampires, I think that that's true uh, in the idea about taking on on the form of an a, uh, an animal, whether that's a bat or a wolf or mm -hmm. what have you. Uh, it's not just something that Stoker invented. He he was reading uh, scholarly papers of the day on Eastern European folklore mm -hmm. uh, that talked about some of these things. Are, so, is it fair to say there are regional ideas? about you know vampires that that they vary across oh certainly yeah they're they're going to vary according to the uh, the different kinds of culture mm -hmm. you know all those cultures are going to have different institutions and the way that they conceive uh, of these beings and uh, you know conceivably experience mm -hmm. these beings is very much uh, culturally determined so you've got you've got core elements. You've got the life, the, the draining of the life force mm -hmm. thing. You've got again these transformations, uh, you know, totemic or otherwise, the shape shifting, and uh, again those are core ideas that are going to vary, you know, regionally. So you mentioned Stoker. So so bring us sort of up to date. We've we've got, you know, the the Roman period again shifts into, you know, what we know as Europe. Mm -hmm. I mean that culture. There, there's, there's cultural continuity there. So where does where do a lot of the conceptions that we're familiar with that you know ultimately Hollywood draws on? Uh, is it Stoker? Is it something? Is it all Eastern European? Are there outliers? Yeah. Well, uh, we're entering into the realm of the literary vampire. Okay. And so, so right, now, right. Uh, w which is not unrelated, uh, of course. Right, but it, it, it would be distinct from the cultural. Distinct yeah. from the, the, the strictly cultural, but, but as I say, not, not completely uh, removed from it because, uh, uh, you know, Stoker himself read quite a bit about Eastern European folklore when he was crafting Dracula. Mm -hmm. um, and so the literary vampire doesn't even really start with Stoker. You have to go back to um, other sources. But Stoker and John Paul Adori, uh, who was the uh, Lord Byron's physician, I think, mm -hmm. uh, um, wrote a book that first gives us the glimpse of, of vampire as a nobleman. And of course, Stoker was influenced by that. You mm -hmm. know, these penny, dr penny dreadfuls that were floating around, you know, the yeah, Victorian yeah. world. Um, and so he combines that with what he finds out about Eastern European folklore and a historical figure, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Vlad Tepish, or Vlad, Vlad the Impaler, one of the, the regional yeah. warlords. Yeah, well, I, you know, I can already tell we're going we're gonna to need to you know, sort of do a sustained episode on that stuff because that, I, I I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm, I'm thinking, I didn't really realize it. Yeah, you know, there is a difference between a literary vampire 
this cultural anthropology Certainly. stuff. And, and you know, Hollywood's going to just mishmash and, you know, do what it does. So, yeah, next time we'll have you back, and I want to zero in on, you know, the whole Vlad the Impaler thing and this history with the literary vampires. It, as a footnote to that, uh, I read a book that really put me on this trail uh, called the, the Prince of Many Faces, Dracula, the Prince of Many Faces, which is about the historical huh. Dracula. And that, that really that taught me, one, on, the, on the one hand, how to do history, on the other hand, to follow this, this trail yeah. uh, about vampires. Wow. All right, well, yeah, that, that'll be a good thing to get into next time. So thanks for being with us. My pleasure. Yeah. And thanks for watching this episode of Fringe Pop 321. Don't forget about our website. Every episode that we do uh, on YouTube has a companion website that goes with it, web page. Go to fringepop321.com and to support us, go to fp321.com slash s. That's the letter S. And thanks for, again for watching. Please come back, watch other episodes because what you know may not be so.